This week, we are going to be talking about Staffordshire myths and legends. Now, there's been a lot in Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Trent, a lot of myths, a lot of legends, and I'm not necessarily going to talk about all of the ones that you know. Some will be familiar to you, some might be new to you, but I'm hoping there's some that will pique your interest. So I'm going to dive right into it, and after the show, you'll be able to go on to my website, which is the Red Aired Stokey, and I've written a blog post to accompany it. So you'll be able to go on, read about them, find out a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll just dive right in and we'll go from there. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the Kids Grove Boggart. Now, this is one that most people who live in Stoke-on-Trent have probably heard of. Um, but what most people don't realise is it's actually two stories that have been confused with each other. So it's a, the Kids Grove Boggart is a spectre that's been terrorising travellers for well over 200 years. Now, the most common version of this is that it's, uh, the legend is that it's a spirit of a woman who was murdered by boatmen when she was travelling to London um, via a canal barge, and she went through the Harecastle Tunnel and the men murdered her. Um, now, the sighting of her headless ghost is thought to you know, bring about doom, disaster, um, and some have even claimed to have seen the ghost on the morning of some of Staffordshire's worst mining disasters. However, that's actually a true story. So it's become a little bit entwined with the real life murder of Christina Collins in 1839. She was travelling via barge from Liverpool to London um, and was killed by the boatmen on the boat that she was on. I'll probably do a full length blog post about this because it's quite a horrible story. But they, the boatmen, when they'd killed her, threw her into the Trent and Mersey Canal. However, the murder didn't actually take place in Kidsgrove. It took place at Brindley Bank near Rugeley. And she didn't lose a head. Then there's a different version of the tale. And the other version is the legend of the Kids Grove or Kit Crew Boggart. Now, this was already a well-known folk tale by the time that Christina was murdered. And an article published in the local newspaper on December the 6th, 1879, shows that the legend actually started way before Christina Collins was murdered. It was probably about 60 years before she was murdered. And it was actually centred around an old community near Kidsgrove that was called Ranscliff. Now, this place doesn't exist anymore. It's been swallowed up by the town. Um, but according to the article, the boggart was known for years and it, was, it, it instilled terror and dread in people. It used to sometimes meet colliers as they were going along the hills or through the lanes that you know wound through the valley, which was Kidsgrove back in the day. Um, it would appear sometimes as a light or be like a flickering on the marsh, which could have been marsh gas at night. There's usually a simple explanation for these things, but people in them days were very, very superstitious. So you can see where it came from. But when people saw this, especially on the morning going to work down a pit, people became full of dread, full of fear. Um, and it was even known to come at night and sing in the dales, sounding like a nightingale, which was probably a nightingale, realistically. Um, now, people believe that this bugger actually predicted some accident or fatality of some kind. And... They usually, if, if someone saw something, then everyone was forewarned and could prepare for something bad happening. Um, but according to the journalist who wrote the article, the Victorian Times, the roots of this village phantom lay with the construction of the canal tunnel, so the Harecastle Tunnel under the hill. Um, but when they were building it, it was actually discussed about the effect of this long, dark underground passage would what the effect would be on the uneducated villagers. Because 
strange sights or sounds, anything slightly out of the ordinary would be viewed with suspicion. And they were right. And again, there's another another tale that is that one man was working on the construction of the Harecastle Tunnel and he was actually killed during the construction. Um, and unfortunately, he did lose his head. And shortly afterwards, his ghost was seen wandering along the passageway where he died. Um, now, after the tunnel was finished, one of the coal mines on Ranscliffe Hill was made to communicate with the tunnel with a foot rail, which was like a tunnel, a small tunnel, with the canal. Now, this was probably for drainage, realistically. Um, and if you go into the Hare Castle train tunnel, you'll see that that's really, really damp in there because everything sort of flowed through the hill and all worked its way down to the canal. So it was just natural to put the drainage that way. Um, and it was in this particular foot rail that the bogret became known because this is apparently where that headless guy died. Um, so at this point, the people who were digging the tunnel, the colliers, they were all so scared that it was actually kind of hard to get them to go to work. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that's the kids grove bugger. And there's different variations of the story, but when you go back and you do your research over the different, you know, the different stories that lead up to it, you can see where the stories come from. Because you've got Christina Collins, who was actually murdered in the in the tunnel, in the Harecastle tunnel. That is a true story. Then you've got the collier who had his head cut off. Again, that genuinely happened while it was being made. So over the years, as these tales were passed down and talked about in the pub, it was all word of mouth. People didn't write them down and they would have got twisted and turned. And that's how we ended up with the Kids Grove Bugget. So, yeah, an interesting one there. So we'll go on to the next one, which is based in Leek. So a little bit further outside of Stoke-on-Trent. And this is the Black Cat of Getliff Yard. So this story goes that there were two women that lived side by side in Getliff Yard. Now, if any of you have been to Getliff Yard in Leek, you'll see that it's a lovely sort of cobbled alleyway hidden down the side of the high street. It's full of shops, restaurants, and it's it's beautiful. It, they've done it really, really well. They've kept all the old buildings. They've modernised all the correct places. And they've saved what is basically a really historic street. But it, didn't, it wasn't always like that. This street used to be industrial. It used to be mills, you know, shops, that sort of thing. And one of the women that lived down there was a baker. And the other one was a fortune teller who had a black cat that liked to wander around the houses and the shops in the area, stealing scraps of food and, you know, just generally being a cat. But despite the locals' efforts to keep the windows and doors closed, the cat, being a cat, always managed to find its way in. So one day, while this woman, the baker, was cooking up a batch of oatcakes, which was her trade, the black cat appeared in the kitchen. Now, the baker didn't want the cat anywhere near a mix because, obviously, cat hair. But she tried to shoo it away, but every time she turned her back, the cat was back trying to get in it. Now, finally, in frustration, she threw a tray of hot oat cakes at the cat, scalding it and causing it to cry out in pain before it ran away. Uh, she immediately felt guilty. Um, so she went immediately round to the neighbour's house, whose cat it was. This is the woman who lived next door to her, the fortune teller. And... When she went into the house looking for the cat, what she actually found was her neighbour, half-dressed, with a burn on her back in the same place that she'd scalded the cat. She left the house immediately, um, really confused, didn't really know what to do. But when she, the baker actually told her customers later in the day and other people in the area, she was having a discussion with them, she told them what she'd seen and... They all believed, like she did, that the black cat was actually the fortune teller and she was a shapeshifter or a witch with the power to transform herself into a black cat. Now, you would think we would go down the line of Molly Lee here and there'd be a witch hunt. But while some were frightened by the idea of having a witch, others believed that if she actually had the power to change her form, 
she must actually have power to read the future, which, if you remember, was actually her job. She was a fortune teller. So this was actually a tale where a witch came better off. She actually, you know, she was caught, or so they say, and it actually got her more custom because people believed that if she was a shapeshifter, she could genuinely read fortunes. So, yeah, something a little bit different there. This is the black-eyed children of Canet Chase. And I've got to be honest with you, it's a bit weird in terms of the fact that, again, this does actually come from a real story. So what are the black-eyed children of Canet Chase? So according to legend, local legend, they're children with pale skin, completely black eyes, who appear to people in the woods and on the roads surrounding Canet Chase. Now, some people say that they come up to cars and ask for a ride home. Some people have just seen them in the woods. Um, if When I was doing a bit of research on this, there's quite a lot of photographs and videos of people that have, you know, sightings of them. But unfortunately, they're all a bit like Bigfoot sightings where they're the grainiest photos ever because they look like they've been taken on a potato. Um, but this is a relatively modern urban legend. This the first recorded sighting of these black eyed children was actually only in the 1980s. And since then, there's been quite a lot of reports of people encountering them in and around Cat kind of Chase. Now, some people think that they're ghosts, while other people think they might be like aliens or some other kind of supernatural being. But one of the most unsettling things about these children is that people describe a feeling of utter dread when they see him like something really bad's going to happen now that's probably just because you're seeing a creepy black-eyed child in the woods it's not going to make you feel good but some people have gone as far as reporting feeling like they've been hypnotized or drawn in by the child's eyes they've had nausea and headaches and some people have even reported being physically ill or weak after their encounter and some people have said that the the children have tried to get into their homes or get into their cars without permission. But I think the saddest part of this is that this urban legend actually stems from three very real murders. In the 1960s, a man called Raymond Morris actually did kill three little girls on the chase. They think he killed five, but he was only ever actually convicted of one. And he did fortunately spend the rest of his life in prison. He was caught and convicted. Um, the three little girls were Margaret Reynolds, who was six, Diane Tift, who was five, and Christine Darby, who was five. But he was only actually convicted of the murder of Christine Darby. But he was caught. I think he died in like 2014 in prison. But they do think that he killed about five. And when all's said and done, people think that the black-eyed children of Canic Chase are the ghosts of these little girls. So whatever it is, I don't know, nobody knows. Is it real? Is it, again, a tale from the 60s that was, you know, talked about these little girls in the pub? Um, and it's just kind of gone from there and gone down into what has essentially become an urban legend. Because I'd actually heard of the black-eyed children of Canic Chase. And it's hard not to. Every When I was researching this, every single national newspaper in England has done a story on it because Cannock Chase comes up as one of the most haunted places in Staffordshire. In fact, one of the most haunted places in the UK. Whether you believe this stuff or not, there is a lot of stuff on there. There was a, a prisoner of war camp in the war, um, murders. It's a creepy woodland. So there's always going to be these stories. But I never knew about these murders. And it was before my time, granted, but there's many other famous murders in Staffordshire that I've heard about. But the black-eyed children of Cannock Chase as an urban legend seems to have overtaken the murder of the children. So I'm hoping that people now have learnt about it. I don't want to go into too much detail about it. It's not a very nice story. If you want to learn about it, you can Google it. His name was Raymond Morris, um, and it was in the 1960s. But I'm not going to talk too much about it, but you can see where these urban legends come from. 
So, yeah, the next one I'm going to do. Now, this is an interesting one. I had not heard anything about this until I did the research. And when I looked into it, I probably could have done a full show, a full blog post just on this topic. But I've kept it short and sweet to pique your interest. And if you do want to learn more about it, if you do want to hear more, please, please do let me know because I will happily write about it all day because I find it fascinating. And it seems to be more on the true side. And this is the Saracens of Biddulph Moor. So the legend goes, basically, that the people of Biddulph Moor in the Staffordshire Moorlands are descendants of a group of Saracen stonemakers that were brought over uh, by a man named Orm of Biddulph in the 13th century. Now, these, it's said that they were stonemasons and he brought them back during the Crusades from the Holy Land. And then these stonemasons, these Saracens, set up home in Biddulph Moor and their descendants became the Bailey family. But they were well known, the Bailey family were, for like quite exotic dark features and uh, quite a unique dialect, which when you live in Staffordshire and people talk in like a Stoke-on-Trent Staffordshire accent, it's very easy to hear people that are not from the area. So this is how this came about. The, there's a church in Biddulph called St. Lawrence's Church, which is believed to have been founded by Orm. And some do say that there's a... a eastern influence in its construction which again might be related to the saracen stonemasons who worked on it so he brought them over they obviously would have had an influence on even if they had built it to his specifications they would have had some kind of influence on how they carved stone how they designed things how they put things together they just would have done it how they knew um there's also a strange font in the nearby St. Mary's Church, which is said to have originally come from Palestine. And if that's true, then it certainly would strengthen the legend. Um, but the first written reference to this story and to this legend was in Slay's A History of the Ancient Parish of Leek in 1862. And it tells a tale of a knight crusader who bought a painting, which is basically a Saracen, back to his estate. Now, this Saracen apparently married an English woman. And then, yeah, their descendants um, are the Bailey family. And if you go into the graveyard in Biddulph Moor, you'll see that there's absolutely loads of people with the surname Bailey. So that would be how they descended to the bit of more people. And to further strengthen that argument, in 1909, a lady called S. Byrne visited Biddulph Moor and she described the people of Biddulph Moor as having oval faces, brown sort of ruddy complexions and hair in shades of auburn. And she claimed that they were descended from 12 Saracen captives that were brought back by the Lord of Nipersley, Orm, from the Third Crusade. So there's a few different arms to this, and th there's quite a lot of record of it being talked about throughout the years. And for something to hold for that long, I mean, we're talking the 1200s, we're talking the 13th century. So there is a slight different objective here. Some people said that they might have been gypsies, but there's a lot more leaning towards the, the, you know, the Crusades and the Saracens. And again, they would have been kidnapped. They wouldn't have come over willingly, I don't think. So the fact that it says here that there was 12 Saracen captives brought back makes much more sense. And there is a little bit more to this in terms of some people do believe that St. Lawrence's Church has a connection to the Knights Templar because there's some stone coffin lids with a, a sword and a, a cross on it um, that was used in the Crusades. But some people claim that it's a, just a Norman style coffin lid. So there's multiple different ideas and thoughts to this. But I do think it's interesting because if you do want to go and research this a little bit more, 
you will find that actually the Bailey family were of a different complexion of people in Biddulph Moor. So they clearly didn't come from Biddulph originally. And it's interesting because where did they come from? Why wouldn't this story be true? I don't think that this is out of the ordinary. I don't think this is something that could be a myth. I think this could be very, very true. And if there's anyone in Biddulph who has done one of them ancestryheritage.com, you know, the things where you send your swab off and they come back and tell you where you're from in the world. If anybody in Biddulph Moor has done that and has got the results, I would genuinely love to hear it. So please do contact me. The, my website's um, the red-haired Stokey. I would love to hear from you because I think this one's true. Now, you don't have to think it's true, but I think it's true because, well, why, why not? Why wouldn't it be? It's just one of them things, isn't it? Everything adds up, all the stories and the research, so yeah. So I'm going to play us another song. And then when I come back, I'm going to talk about a chap called Sauntering Ned. And Sauntering Ned had a donkey. And I'll tell you that story in a moment. When we come back. So, yeah, anybody got any questions? I'd love to know what you guys think about the guys in Biddulph being descendant from Saracens. I mean, don't forget you guys on YouTube, you can comment. You can leave a comment and talk to me on here. So if anybody wants to do that, just let me know, just drop me a comment. And Yeah, the next story is about Sauntering Ned. Don't know if anybody's heard of Sauntering Ned in Bucknell. But I uh, I grew up in Bucknell, so it's quite an interesting one. And again, one I haven't heard of before, so. Again, I'm sorry I can't play the music too loud, but I'm live on um, A Up Duck Radio. And unfortunately, YouTube doesn't particularly like copyrighted music played, so it will cut me off if it catches me. So I've just put it on quietly so you can hear it. Yeah, if anybody's got any questions about anything that I'm talking about, you can either ask me now, contact me afterwards on my website, which is the Red Ed Stokey, or you can email me. Messaging now is probably the easiest thing. Ever. I'm also considering at the end of these, we don't do it in like a season. I'm thinking that I might compile all these into a book if anybody would be interested in reading it. I would be in, uh, you know, I would happily publish it, is the word. 
So yeah, please let me know if you would be interested in reading more about these. Hi guys, welcome back. So this is the red-haired Stokey, and today I'm talking about the myths and legends of Staffordshire. Some that you're familiar with, some that might be completely new to you, but either way, all pretty interesting. This story is about a man and his donkey. Now, I'd never heard of this, which is shocking because it's actually set in Bucknell, where, where I'm from, Abbey on Bucknell. But this is the story of Sauntering Ned. Now, this is quite a popular tale in the Potteries, and it's been told many times over the years with slight variations, just like all other myths and legends. But I've tried to put it all together into a bit more of like a story, so I'll, I'll tell you that now. Ned was basically a man who preferred the outdoors, which when you're growing up in the Potteries isn't great because you're going to be working in a factory or a warehouse, and this is what Ned did. But he preferred the outdoors, so he decided to leave the Potteries and go travelling to sell pots, plates, bowls, you know, flog his wares. However, he soon found out that he actually needed to work every day to make money. You know, an issue that we all have. So what he did is he travelled all over the county, all over Staffordshire, to sell his wares. And he became well known for just idly wandering along with his donkey and his little cart. And that's how he gained the name Sauntering Ned. But he made enough money. Each time he went, he sold a few pots made enough money to buy a few more pots and fill back his cart. And then he kept going to different markets and selling enough just to get by. And he was happy. He was wandering around with his little donkey and his little cart and just enjoying his life, tootling around the countryside, meeting people. But travelling around the county back in those days was quite dangerous because some of these markets were quite far away, which meant he would be travelling back in the dark. So... To deter any robbers while he was travelling on his cart, he cleverly attached a chain to the donkey's back leg to drag on the floor to make a noise to scare people away. Which, again, we know that people were really superstitious in them days, so as daft as that sounds now, it probably worked. And because he also used to collect things from the market, he got a, a headdress, which was like a like horns, like bull horns or something, and he made it into a headdress for his donkey, so you'd hear the, this horrible dragging chain noise and turn around and there was like a big donkey with its massive ears and horns coming at you. You probably wouldn't rob him, would you? Let's be honest. Um, he only used it at night and he kept it in a sack on his cart in the day. But there was one night in November, it was raining, it was cold, and he was travelling back from Cheadle Market to Stoke-on-Trent. And partway through his journey, Ned and his donkey stopped in Bucknell for a rest. Now, Bucknell was a very different place than it is today. So he went up into the village square and he sat down. It stopped raining. He was exhausted. Um, and soon he, he just fell asleep. When suddenly his peaceful slumber was interrupted by the shouts of two men who came running out of the churchyard, which was St. Mary's Church, screaming about seeing the devil. So his eyes shot open, he saw these guys running away, and a quick look round, he realised that his donkey was missing. So after the men had, had run off down the street, he listened carefully, but he couldn't hear the sound of his donkey's scraping chain, so he was a bit worried about where it had gone. So he decided to go and have a look in the churchyard, which was where the men had fled from. So he, he, he called out the donkey's name, had a look round, and stumbled upon the gra the animal grazing amongst the graves quite happily. And he breathed a sigh of relief, you know, his donkey hadn't run off. He was quite happy. But while he was collecting his donkey from the graveyard, he noticed that one of the graves was open and a couple of spades lay on the floor nearby. And he dawned, it, it dawned on him then that the two men were probably grave robbers. <laughs> and they turned round while they were digging the grave and his donkey was stood over them with its horns in the darkness and 
they must have been absolutely terrified. I mean, that'd be terrifying nowadays. Back in them days when it was superstitious and people were terrified of everything. I just think that's hilarious. So he chuckled to himself and he never thought that his donkey would be an effective deterrent against criminals. Um, so being the good citizen that he was, he filled the grave back in. And when he got back to the street with his donkey, he realised that the men had actually left a long wooden cart for putting a coffin or a body in. And it was much bigger than his little tiny cart that he'd got. So he swapped it. He pinched the long, bigger cart because he thought it would be great for carrying more pots and crockery and he could make a bit more money in the same journey. So he strapped it to his donkey, shifted his remaining pots and things onto the new cart and continued home. Now, this was fortuitous for him because with the ability to carry more items to market, his business grew. And he eventually passed the business down onto his sons. And he still travelled about with his donkey, but he downsized again to a little smaller cart and enjoyed a more relaxed pace of life in his retirement. But he spent the rest of his life telling anyone that had listened the story of the devil donkey and how it had scared off the grave robbers. And he couldn't help but chuckle at the memory. And to be honest same because i think that's absolutely hilarious and that story is actually really well recorded in a lot of places so i don't have any doubts that that happened and i love the fact that it was in my local area as well i think that's great okay so we've got a couple more to get through now one that you've probably all heard of is mermaid pool so i'm just going to touch on this briefly now, Mermaid Pool is in Staffordshire, but it is up on the edge of the Peak District, and it's called Blakemere, also known as the Black Pool. And this is the site of what may be the only inland mermaid legend in England. And this little remote hilltop pond, I'm, I mean, they say lake, but it's so small if you've ever been. It's about 50 metres wide. I don't even think it's that big, personally. Um, but it's quite an atmospheric place, and... Legend says that livestock won't graze there or birds won't even fly over. Now, that I do believe because it is a strange place. It's on like a crag, like a, a barren southern edge of the Peak District. And it's next to the leak to Buxton Road. It's it's You've got to go up there to really understand why it's such a strange place. And the dark peat stained waters of the pool are said to be bottomless. Um, now, there is one thing that did happen here, which is true. And in the over the centuries, it's there's been quite a few things happening there, mysterious drownings. But one of them was actually a murder. And it was in 1676 when a woman peddler was dumped in the pool by a local villain. And the tradition is that the mermaid rises from the pool at midnight to lure, you know, unwary travellers to the deaths. But only single men, apparently. And there's various legends concerning the origin of the mermaid. One of them is that a sailor from a nearby village, Thorncliffe, fell in love with her at the sea when he was out at sea. And he brought her back. Um, that goes on to say something like she died. Uh, he died. She didn't because she was immortal. And, you know, that's why she haunts the area. And the other one is that she was originally a witch who transformed herself into a water nymph after being thrown into the pool during the Middle Ages. I mean, at one stage, the, the locals even tried to drain the pool to uncover its secrets. They dug the edge out and tried to drain the water out, but it didn't work. And that's why the pool's got like a strange sort of heart shape, which is caused from where the locals dug it. But I think it's safe to say that the mermaid is probably just a legend. But I thought I'd touch on that one. Now, this is an, another interesting one. This is the Headless Horseman of Butterton Moor. Now, the Headless Horseman, we all know the legend of the Headless Horseman. It's all over the world. But I think many people would be shocked to find that we've got our own Headless Horseman in Staffordshire. Now, this is a terrifying apparition that's haunted the quiet country roads around Oncourt, Butterton, Warslow and even Leek for centuries. Now, some say that the Headless Horseman is an evil spirit cast out of heaven, forced to wander the lonely moors, while others believe it was a murderer who was beheaded for his crimes. 
Um, but the origins of this legend are lost in time. But one of the most familiar stories, and the one that if you've heard of this legend, you've probably heard yourself, is about a farmer who's returning home to Oncut from Lick Market. So he was quite tired, riding his horse, his head muddled with beer. Uh, not riding his horse, sorry, he was walking. He was head was muddled with beer, and he saw a man riding a horse a little way ahead of him. So thinking he was a neighbour, he asked him for a lift home. However, upon getting onto the horse, he realised it was a headless horseman. Now, he said that the phantom horse sprang away, clearing fences, hedges and trees, bounding through the air at tremendous speed. And the farmer, who was completely in the horseman's power, there's nothing he could do but cling on for dear life as he was buffeted along. Um, at the end of the ride, apparently, he was thrown to the ground near to his own home, which was lucky. But he was so badly bruised and broken by the journey that he was put to bed. And within a few days, he actually died. And another story, similar, a woman of the village had travelled to Warsaw to visit friends. And after a time, her husband, a farmer, arrived to take her home. And as they were riding back, the headless horseman fell into step next to him. The horse was terrified that they were riding, but the wife couldn't see it. Only the husband could. And he didn't say anything during the ride. But it was only when they got back home that he actually admitted to his wife what he'd seen. And they were both quite alarmed, obviously. Um, and apparently the horse died the next day um, while it was plowing in the field. Their dog, too, also got sick and died. Um, they seem to have survived this ordeal, though. But these are only two of many, many sightings and stories about this headless horseman. Nothing recently, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, the legend of the headless horseman has been told over and over again all over the world. But I think this local one has probably come from people sitting around the fire in the Dog and Partridge, which is the pub in the village, and just talking about it. And again, over the years, it's just been passed down and turned into something which has become a local legend. This one is actually about a stone, the board stone. And the board stone is located between the end of the Roaches and Hen Cloud in the Peak District, still in Staffordshire. And it can be reached by walking from Lud Church and like going over the rocks. If you just Google it, it's actually quite easy to find. Now, this is believed to be a dolmen, which is basically like a prehistoric burial mount, burial area. So it's it's two like upright pointed pillars and a short edge of rock. And then this massive stone is balanced on top of it. And there's like a pool of water underneath it. So it's ever strange. If it's Is it natural? I don't think so. But I... If you just saw that and nothing else, you would assume that it was, was a natural thing. But when you've seen other man-made structures that are similar, you can see why people believe that it was made by man. Now, legend has it that the stone possesses magical healing powers for everyone that touches it. But again, its original purpose is, is a mystery. It is possible that it was a Neolithic burial site because it is similar in design to other Neolithic burial sites throughout the country. Now, during the spring solstice, the board stone apparently aligns with the serpent stone on Ramshaw Rocks, which has got like the head of a serpent coming from the earth. And the name board stone is thought to come from the Welsh word board, meaning table. And with the three stones supporting it, believed to be its legs. Now, people have claimed to have been cured of ailments after touching the stone. Um, one person even said that they'd had an injury for two and a half years before the pain disappeared within two days of touching the stone. But due to its non-Christian healing powers, the board stone was actually painted white. The Christians decided to take over what was basically a pagan symbol. Um, and they painted it white. They whitewashed it to symbolise good over evil. And until the start of the Second World War, the people from like Leek and surrounding areas would actually bring individuals who were ill to crawl underneath the stone 
knocking the devil from the backs, apparently. Um, although this custom was relatively new, it shouldn't be confused with the stone's pagan healing properties, which probably came from the fact that it had quite a high quartz content and sits on a powerful ley line. But interestingly, I did find some information on it that said that in the pool underneath, there is like a type of algae that grows in there that's good for healing skin complaints, which would make sense. You know, if you go back and think about paganism and, you know, back when we used to know the plants and what they were used for, and you know, people would make natural remedies for things. It would make sense that if you climbed into this water, it was full of an algae that, you know, helped to, to cure ailments that you would genuinely be better after you'd been in it. It's probably nothing to do with the rock. But again, it depends on what you believe in. And it must have been doing something because even the Christians thought that if they crawled in the water, it knocked the devil off the back. And, you know, and it's still there now. Take a walk up, have a look at it. It's just another one of them strange legends that we'll never know where it came from. But the next one, the last one that we're going to talk about is... Etruria's white rabbit. Now, Etruria is very different today than it was when this story starts. So Etruria was the site of Wedgwood's pottery factory. And the residents had to take a journey to Hanley that was via a path that cut across the fields to Cobridge. It's pretty much all been built on now, so you can't really see where it was. But during daylight the route passed through a shaded woodland, which was actually planted by Wedgwood, and the locals referred to it as Etruria Grove. However, as the sun set, the grove took on a little bit of a more sinister tone. So people said that when they were walking through the woods that they could hear um, a little boy's voice crying out for help in the darkness, and people had actually reported seeing um, like a ghostly white rabbit hopping about. The locals were terrified. More than one person reported this. It genuinely terrified them. Um, and one person actually tried to catch the rabbit. However, it vanished and, you know, left this person with a dislocated shoulder. And the tale carried on until the grove was basically built over with industrialisation. But again, the story's got a basis in fact, unfortunately. So... It was believed that to be the spirit of a boy who'd been murdered several years earlier in like a woody dell between Crabtree Field and the canal. And this is a true story. So this little boy's mother, uh, he, he was working, I think, at Wedgwood's factory. Um, I think they were, it was like 10 hour days. He was like eight years old or something like that. And he was supposed to come home from work and bring his mother his wages, but he didn't. He didn't come out because apparently they'd gone gambling to the local. There was there used to be a, like a race course in Etruria, and him and another lad from the pottery had gone and spent the day gambling their earnings, um, continuing past dusk when they should have been home, until the older boy who had lost all his money attacked the young boy he was with. And they had a fight and he did kill the younger lad. In a panic, the, the older boy, who was about 15, 16, decided to make it look like a suicide and strung the younger lad up with a piece of string round his neck. But his efforts were in vain and he was caught and he was tried to murder for murder. He was initially sentenced to death, but because he was young, he was transported. Um... I think he was transported to Tran Tan Tasmania. Now, all of this happened in 1834, and the victim's name was John Holcroft, and the murderer was Charles Shaw. And the records of all this are online. It genuinely happened. Um, it was in the local newspaper. The, the court documents are available. And... It's interesting to wonder what happened to Charles after he was transported. There are some records that he got married while he was over there and he ended up living a life. 
but it was an it was a terrible tragedy. He probably didn't mean to kill the younger lad, but this story again left its mark on the local area. And I'm not sure where the white rabbit came from. That's a strange one. I'm just going to assume that there was a white rabbit that somebody saw when they were walking home after a couple of beers through the woods and it scared them because let's be honest, after a couple of beers, walking through the woods isn't the best idea nowadays. But back then, after hearing that story of murder and finding a lad in the woods and having a couple of beers and walking home, your mind would start to play tricks on you, which is the only way I can think that the white rabbit came into it. But yeah, so that's pretty much all we've got time for today. So thank you very, very much for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned a few things that you didn't know about the local area. And if you would like to read more, you can go onto my website, which is the Red Herd Stokey, and you can read a bit more about what I've talked about. And if you would like to listen to any of my previous shows, you can do on most podcast services. It is available as a podcast. Just search for the Red Herd Stokey, whether it's on Spotify or Apple Music or anything like that. And you can also head to my YouTube channel and watch the previous videos. But yeah, head over to the website, sign up for the newsletter so you don't forget anything. So I can always send you anything that I find interesting. And yeah, thank you very, very much for joining me.